Good afternoon. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and, and for hosting me here today. It's such an incredible privilege to be here um, in the Philippines. Uh, the team, the Teach for the Philippines team, Margarita and, and Clarissa and Lizzie, uh, and the incredible board members and supporters who are in the room. I, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be able to spend the day here just talking with you, your, your staff. I'm so excited to meet the first fellows this afternoon and I've just been so impressed uh, thus far with, with everything. So um, I'm excited to have the chance now to just share a bit about my journey, how I came to this, you know, it's, it's kind of an unlikely story, which, which I'll get into in a minute. I never would have dreamed 23 years ago when I was sitting in uh, my dorm at Princeton uh, that somehow this work would bring me to, you know, Manila today, talking with all of you. So um, I also am, you know, looking forward to sharing really the lessons I've learned along the way, not only um, through this work in the United States, but now... Um, you know, as I see it play out all around the world and, and how those lessons fuel my sense of urgency and I think the collective sense of urgency and sense of responsibility across the Teach for All network um, and sense of possibility that uh, we can take action here in a way that, that improves our, our collective welfare. Um, so just to dive into this, um, here on your left, you can see, of course, here I was at Princeton. Um, and as you heard, this was my undergraduate thesis uh, proposal. Our generation at the time was known as the me generation. People were absolutely convinced that liberal arts graduates like myself just wanted to go, you know, get rich. We all supposedly wanted to work on Wall Street. And that label just didn't strike me as right. I felt like I was one of thousands of graduating seniors who were actually searching for something else, um, who were searching for a way to make a real difference in the world. So I thought the problem actually wasn't the generation, but rather the recruiters, all of which at the time, this is 1989, all of the recruiters were these investment banks and management consulting firms banging down our doors trying to get us to commit just two years to work in their firms. And so I had been very focused as a concerned college student um, and, and a public policy major on the issue of educational inequity in, in our country. And one day that kind of passion came together with this kind of angst I was feeling around like what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I just thought, you know what? why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our highest need communities? Um, and, and I became obsessed with that idea because I thought on the one hand, you know, we'd be channeling all this energy, all this energy that's good enough for all these firms on Wall Street, but into classrooms where I thought, um, you know, there would be a tremendous impact in the lives of kids. And at the same time, I thought there would be this larger power as well because we'd be taking all these future leaders and having those first two influential years out of college you know be working in our under-resourced communities instead of on wall street and i just thought that would influence the priorities the consciousness of a generation so i i became truly obsessed and i was blessed with a huge advantage which was and i say this to young people all the time my complete inexperience and naivete. I had no idea that this was a crazy idea. And so developed this plan that said in the first year, I was actually gonna make this happen and we would inspire thousands of people to apply and would train in place no fewer than 500 of them um, in urban and rural communities across the country. I had a whole budget that said this was going to cost two and a half million dollars at the time. I turned in my thesis, my thesis advisor read it, called me into his office, and as he now, he, he later recounted the story, he said, I told her she was deranged. Um, but the thing that he was most fixated on was that $2.5 million number. 
he was like, do you know how hard it is to raise $2,500? And, but you know, again, I had my naivete and inexperience. So I said, I don't know, but I think Ross Perot is going to fund this. I don't know if you all would know who Ross Perot is, but I had grown up in Dallas, Texas. And, you know, he was a big Texas businessman and I knew that he was very committed to education reform. And I knew nothing else, but I thought, He's an entrepreneur, he's committed to education, I think he'll fund it. And you know what? About 11 letters to Ross Perot later, he actually called me up, agreed to meet with me, and by that point, we actually did have 2,500 people who had applied in response to this grassroots recruitment campaign. We had selected 500 of them. This was about to become a real embarrassment because we didn't have the money. And so I've never been so determined in my life, but I walked into his office and told myself I was going to glue myself to his chair until he gave us the money. And two hours later, he said, I'll tell you what, he was clear I wasn't going anywhere. If you can raise the other $2 million, I'll give you 500,000. And that was all we needed. Once he did that, all the other people I'd been able to meet along the way came through and. So one year after that long initial story, but one year after I graduated, I was looking out on an auditorium full of the first 489 Teach for America Corps members who had signed up um, for, this, for this adventure. And you know that was really the beginning of an incredible journey. And it's a journey that you know, I feel like we're still you know, in some ways in the early days up. Um, I realized very quickly how hard this was going to be. You know, how hard it is to recruit and select not just anyone, but the people with the leadership characteristics necessary. Uh, and to train and support them so that they not only survive a first year of teaching in the most challenging communities, but actually excel and have a positive impact for their kids and learn the lessons that come from success and not from disillusionment and, and failure. Uh, and then go on to you know, work for the larger changes that we need to see. So there were immense programmatic learning curves and organizational learning curves, um, but through a lot of support from a lot of rooms full of people that, that look kind of like this one, uh, we were able to build something uh, that is in fact thriving and you can see where we are today in the United States um, where each year, this year 57,000 people applied to Teach for America. Uh, if you look at the top 200 colleges in our country, between 5 and 25 percent of the senior classes are now competing to channel their energy into teaching for two years in our urban and rural schools. And that would have been absolutely inconceivable 20 years ago. As you heard, we now have 10,000 teachers in the midst of their two-year commitment. They're across 46 urban and rural communities, and there's a growing body of research that really shows that they are having a positive impact on their students' achievement, even as it relates to uh, experienced teachers in, in their schools. And, and the thing that I think has surprised many is that, you know, so many people may think Teach for America and they think about those two years. But the power of Teach for America isn't the two years. It's about what happens every year after those two years. So there are now 28,000 Teach for America alumni. And in fact, almost all of them are still working deeply engaged in these issues. 63% of them full-time in education. I mean, these are people who came into this so unsuspecting. They were going to teach for two years before going into corporate corporations and law schools and med schools. They had not majored in education. They could have done anything. But ultimately, that experience is so transformational for them that it influences their career trajectories, their priorities, and such. So, you know, a third of them are teaching, another third are in positions of leadership in education, 700 school principals, hundreds of folks in school district roles, state commissioners of education and, and, and such. And then another, say 20%, are in positions of leadership in policy, 
are working in law, are working in medicine, but are working in roles that enable them to take on um, some of the kind of root causes of the problems that we see in education. Um, so, whoops, excuse me. Now, I never, there's so much more to be done in the United States that I never would have thought, I wasn't thinking about the rest of the world, honestly. But I started thinking about it when I started meeting such inspiring social entrepreneurs from you know, such diverse contexts all over the world who were just determined to take on this same issue of educational inequity in their country um, and who had a vision for essentially adapting this model to their context for calling upon their country's most promising future leaders and, calling and asking them to commit two years to teach in high need contexts, and then cultivating their leadership as, as a force for change. Um, so their initiative ultimately led to the formation of, of the Teach for All Network, uh, which is working to, to accelerate the impact of this model all around the world. We're addressing a pervasive reality. The fact that, and this is true in almost every country, irrespective of the level of its development, socioeconomic background predicts educational outcomes. This is still very true in, in my own country. You know, a fifth of the United States' kids grow up below the poverty line, and 8% of them will get a college degree. In an economy where a college degree is really fundamental to attaining the kind of job that will enable you to break the cycle of poverty, 8% versus 80% of kids who are born into the top quartile of family income. Um, in fact, in my country, sadly, of all the advanced countries, where kids are born is still most predictive of their educational outcomes. Um, at the same time, this is a pervasive problem, of course, here in the Philippines, and it's the problem that the team here is working to address. The fact that by, the, by grade six, only one third of Philippine children in the public schools are independent readers. The fact that 50% of the kids don't start secondary school uh, and only 14% of kids will make it through the whole system uh, is, is just more evidence that again, here in this, in this country as well, um, this is a massive problem. And we all know that education is so fundamental we believe this is, is, and I believe it's, it's a moral injustice. You know, we're not providing our kids with the opportunity to fulfill their true potential. But we know that there are tremendous economic consequences. I think, you know, McKinsey did a whole study that showed that this problem itself is creating the equivalent of uh, a permanent economic recession. Uh, and, and we know in this world, too, that you know, low educational levels, growing educational disparities just breeds intolerance and creates many of the public safety threats that we see. So we believe that this is one of the world's, you know, most significant problems and are working to address it um, essentially through building movements within each of these countries, movements for expanding educational opportunities. So each of these programs goes out to their college campuses and recruits just as aggressively as the most aggressive corporate recruiters to, to find the folks who have the leadership skills um, necessary to succeed during two years and to go on and affect change in their countries. They invest in their development. Um, through in their training, in their ongoing professional development, in pursuit of positive impacts for the kids in their classrooms, and in, in pursuit of helping them gain the foundational experience that comes from teaching successfully um, in, in this context. And then they stay with them. They continue to invest in their leadership as alumni. Um, they help them move into positions of influence in the education system, in the political system, whatever makes sense within that country in, in pursuit of ensuring that ultimately not just a few but many of the nation's leaders will have that shared experience, will be deeply committed to ensuring educational opportunity for all, and will be working from every level of the education system at every level of policy across sectors 
in order to affect the fundamental systemic changes necessary to actually um, you know, realize a vision of educational excellence and equity. Now, I thought, as I mentioned, that I would just take a few minutes to share the three most salient lessons of this work for me. And there are three lessons that come together to really fuel my optimism about the potential of this work here in the Philippines and, and globally as well. The first of them is really a lesson that came to me most recently through the work at Teach for All. And, you know, when I started out with Teach for All, and I remember when I first got on the, the plane to India to meet one of the first kind of visionary entrepreneurs uh, who was determined to launch Teach for India, I was thinking that I would be overwhelmed by the differences between the United States and India. And of course, there are many, many differences. But honestly, five days later, what I could not get over was the similarities. If you start spending time in classrooms, and I've found that this is true, I could be in classrooms in Colombia, classrooms in uh, you know, China, wherever it may be, you realize that the challenges facing the most marginalized kids are very similar. Their reality is more similar than it is different from place to place. They face many extra challenges that other kids don't face, and they're showing up in schools that if they're lucky, and they're never lucky, have the same resources, certainly not the extra resources necessary to meet their extra needs. So the solution for those kids, like the kind of teacher they need, is much more similar from place to place than it is different. And then you start spending time at the school level and at the system level, and the patterns that emerge, the, the patterns in policy and practice, the patterns in mindsets that perpetuate the current system, it's, it's really quite overwhelming. The similarities are far more striking than the differences. The reason I think this is important to think about is that what it means is that the solutions are shareable. It means that we will move a lot more quickly in tackling this problem if we can learn from the promising efforts that are going on from community to community and, and country to country. The second most salient lesson of this work, and, and this is really the first and most striking thing uh, that I came to through, through our work uh, at Teach for America, is that this problem that I think is generally perceived to be so intractable. I mean, of course, socioeconomic background predicts educational outcomes. When I said that, everyone probably thought, sure. I mean, 23 years ago in the United States, no one was talking about that because the assumption was, of course, you would have to fix poverty to solve that problem. We don't know how to fix poverty, so we are at a standstill in this. And I think what we have seen over time is that actually we can make a meaningful difference in the face of this problem. We can provide kids who face the extra challenges of poverty with an education that enables them to have the tools to get out of poverty. And I learned this first from spending time in, in classrooms with some of the most remarkable of our teachers. Um, this is a teacher on your left named Ivy Martinez, uh, and, and she's actually a, a pretty recent Teach for America core member. She finished her two-year commitment a year or so ago. Um, and, you know, I, I, her story is memorable to me because when I visited her classroom, she was teaching in San Jose in, in the Bay Area of California, and she had taught the same kids for two years. Um, so when they came into her room as fourth graders, they were reading on about the first grade level, and they were already completely disengaged in school. So Ivy is a rare person, and she just determined that she was going to put her kids on a path to actually get through college, which is something that, again, most low-income kids, and certainly in, in the community in which she was working, just simply don't do. Well, by the time I visited her room, her kids were in fifth grade, and I had a fifth grader at the time, which is why I think this, this story just really stuck with me. So I'm standing in the back of her room, and I'm watching her fifth graders read a novel. And they're engaged in a level of critical discussion of this novel. I mean, her kids were so engaged, it was almost like I was in a college classroom, and I realized standing there, 
that her kids are performing above where my own kid on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and his classmates were performing. And then I spent more time with her and I saw some other just incredible things. You know, I watched her kids get together in circles, which they call leadership circles, and give each other feedback on their leadership from the previous week. Now, if you ask the kids in my kids' classroom to do that, I can't even imagine what would happen. I mean, I can just imagine Snickers all over the room, like, what is this? The kids were taking this so seriously. And, and honestly, the, the ultimate, what I, what I saw so much evidence of in, in Ivy's room was that, you know, she truly, for her kids, she was a transformational teacher. She changed everything for her kids. They were showing up at school wondering what's the point. And by working with her kids and her kids' parents, she helped them realize that they could in fact own, you know, the drive to get to and through college and that that would make a difference in their lives. And she gave them the tools from the leadership and self-advocacy skills to the academic skills to actually be able to do that. Now, it's pretty daunting when you start meeting the Ivies of the world, and I've now met Ivies in many different countries, and they're all kind of superheroes. And they're doing, you know, they're, they're very rare, and so when you think about how big this problem is, it becomes daunting because you just think, are we really going to get to the point where millions and millions of teachers who are working with our highest need kids are, are able to do that? And honestly, I'm very skeptical. I, I, don't, I don't know that that's the answer, right? So what's been encouraging is to see the ivies of the world go on and create a new kind of school that makes it possible for normal teachers, talented, committed teachers, but not absolute superheroes, to actually meet the extra needs of their kids and move them ahead. This is a school, this is Max Heimendorf, this picture in the middle. Uh, he was an alum of Teach First, uh, which started 10 years ago in the UK, an, an adaptation of this, of this model. Um, Max started a school. Uh, it's called King Solomon Academy, and it serves the highest need kids in, in London. Um, this school, I think we could go so far as to say, is a, is a transformational school. He's working to take the highest need kids, 16% uh, of whom will typically go to a selective university, He's working to get them all into selective universities. And in fact, the fifth graders in his school are outperforming the seventh graders in the regular neighborhood school. Um, I've been so inspired to now see hundreds of schools like Max's all over the United States and now cropping up all over the world, many of them in the hands of, of the Teach for uh, All program alumni. Um, so the Ivies of the world, the Maxes of the world are showing us that we can have truly transformational change for our highest need kids. Um, you know, so now the question that we ask ourselves, and we see so much evidence of the possibility of transformational change now in the United States that the conversation has changed a lot. And it's not, can it be done? It's how do we do it at scale? And can we actually get to the point where we see whole communities providing their highest need kids with the kind of education that would you know, actually open up different opportunities for them? And even to that question, we now have evidence actually all over the world that it is possible to affect meaningful change on a, a, on a significant kind of community-wide scale. This is a picture of New Orleans. And, um, you know, when we started placing teachers in New Orleans 23 years ago, it was, we, we thought it was the toughest place to be in the United States. And we would see eighth graders reading if we were lucky at the second grade level. And it seemed that nothing was going to change about New Orleans. Um, but the latest data just came out a week ago about, about New Orleans. And in the last six years, they have moved from having 54% of their kids graduate from high school, which in the US is a pretty standard urban graduation rate from high school. They've moved that to 78%, which means that the percentage of kids graduating from high school in New Orleans is actually higher than the national average. This is the highest poverty African-American population you can find in a city 
in our country. Now, not only have they done that, though, when, when you know, 54% of the kids were graduating, 25% of them were college ready based on the assessments that they use. Now, 40% of the 78% who are graduating are, quote, college ready. While there's still a long way to go in New Orleans, when you listen to data like that, you realize that took six years, six years. That is meaningful change in a big city that is, you know, in a system that's hard to move in a mere six years. And once again, it gives me real optimism that we can make a meaningful difference against this problem. So this is the second lesson of our work. And, you know, it is motivating for me personally and for many of us who are in this work because once you realize that we can do something about this problem, you realize that we have a responsibility to do something about it. The third lesson has to do with the role of leadership. Now, what I have discovered over time in the United States, and I realize now that this is a worldwide phenomenon, is that, you know, we really, there's a lot of commitment to improving education. We want to solve this problem tomorrow. And so it leads many policymakers and others to lurch from one big idea after another. You know, there's a new silver bullet every, in fact, in the U.S., we could name every year for the last 20 years. One year was the year of the project-based curriculum, and then there was the year of give every kid a computer, and, like, we really let ourselves lurch. And yet, when you really get into what was at work in the classrooms like Ivy's, the schools like Max's, the communities like New Orleans, you realize it's no one thing. This is about, it's actually about what all of you probably know from your own work is always at work in anything. It's always about a lot of hard work. And that means that people, talent, leadership are at the absolute core of the solution. So when you think about what Ivy did differently, she did what a great leader would do. You know, she walked into a situation that a lot of teachers would give up on and said, you know what, here's the vision, to and through college. And then she got her kids on a mission like a great leader does. And then she was incredibly purposeful and goal-oriented and relentless. She did whatever it took to get her kids on that path. You spend time in schools like Max's and you realize always without any exception where you have a transformational school, there is a school leader who is on a personal mission to ensure that every one of the kids gets on a trajectory to success and who has the leadership skills necessary to build a team, build a culture, and to make it happen no matter what comes at them. And when you spend time in the New Orleanses of the world, you realize as well, this ultimately was about a constellation of leaders, people working within education, and people working outside of education, business leaders, philanthropic leaders, political leaders, who came together because they had seen, by spending a lot of time in schools kind of like Max's, but in the United States, that we could have transformational change and were just determined that they had to be the ones to make it happen for their community. This is a motivating lesson for all of us at Teach for All because you know, cultivating that leadership is really the mission of, of all of these programs. Um, in fact, if you go to New Orleans, you realize this is in many ways a Teach for America revolution. 40% of the schools in New Orleans are led by school principals who are Teach for America alumni. The school district superintendent uh, was a Teach for America alum. He's now the state commissioner of education working to spread the reforms across the state. The leader of the organization that really orchestrated those reforms, it's called New Schools for New Orleans, the founder and the leader is a Teach for America alum, and I could really go on and on. A third of the kids in New Orleans are taught by either Teach for America core members or alumni. So in the United States now, it's, it's you know, we're lucky because 23 years in, we have a growing force of these leaders, and whether you're in Chicago or D.C. or you know, Los Angeles um, or New Orleans, you know, there's a critical mass of these folks to work with. 
Um, what we're hoping to do at Teach for All is to support the new Teach for All programs to get there a lot earlier than, than 20 years, and we have lots of optimism that that, that is possible. Um, we have seen all over the world that there is a magnetic power and pull to this model, meaning, you know, it, it's quite remarkable, and I've been struck again today here in the Philippines um, at the caliber and the kind of hearts and minds and souls of our future leaders who are just drawn to this. Um, and it's really true. We have yet to find a country where it's not true. Um, but certainly it's true in the Philippines. Um, you know, I can't wait to meet these folks, the first 54 uh, fellows of Teach for the Philippines who were recruited and selected so carefully, valedictorians of universities, summa cum laude graduates. I mean, I keep hearing the stories, but these are just absolutely exceptional people. And they're people who are coming to this um, because they want to be part of essentially nation building. And they see, this is what I'm, I'm told, they see that this is a way um, to build uh, the Philippines' future. They will, after this training that they're currently in, uh, begin teaching in grade three, as I understand it, in, tell me again, Quezon City, yes. Um, which, so we're at the beginning here, but um, it, I have no doubt that uh, from everything I've, I've gathered from the team, that this is, not only are we off to a great start, um, but there are even, even better days ahead. Um, and, you know, again, thinking back to this, this point about how universal this problem is and how shareable the solutions are, I'm so excited by what I see happening here in the Philippines because I know both that, you know, ultimately this will help raise educational levels here in the Philippines, but also because I know that what you learn here will inform an increasingly global movement. Um, and I just so believe and, and deeply know that, you know, in the coming decade or so, we will have in dozens and dozens of countries around the world thriving movements that are enlisting their country's most promising leaders, channeling their energy against this problem um, as in diverse contexts that inspire different ways of thinking and innovation as part of a global network where people are sharing solutions and therefore accelerating more quickly than they otherwise would. Um, and I just think about that world, you know, you imagine a world of growing educational disparities and falling educational levels, and that is a world that we don't want to live in, you know, with, with, you know, less economic prosperity and, you know, worse public safety threats and all, but you imagine the opposite, you know, a world of rising educational levels and shrinking disparities. Um, and that's a world, you know, growing in economic prosperity um, with better and better health outcomes uh, and, and where all of us, all of us benefit. Um, we can realize this vision that brings us all together at Teach for All. I, I will have to say, um, and, and just pause for a minute and say that, you know, you all can ensure that it's true in the Philippines. I have watched now all over the world, certainly in the US, that it's the initiative of the kind of business community that enables these programs not only to launch, but to then scale and improve and, and thrive over time. Um, I know that we can realize this vision that all kids have access to an excellent education. And to me, based on everything I've seen, the only question is whether enough of our country's future leaders will step up and decide to lead us to this day. Um, I think you can make sure that the answer to that question is yes. Um, and really just wish you the best of luck in, in that charge and look forward to, to seeing this happen here over time. So thank you very much.